Lord Jesus, we thank you that because of what you've done in giving your life on the cross, we are forgiven and restored. And we bring to you the broken bits of our lives today, and we offer them to you. We, we confess all the things we've done wrong, and we ask for your forgiveness and your restoration. And can I remind us, we are, f are forgiven. You are forgiven in Christ. All the past is wiped away, and there's a new start. And Father, we pray that you would lead us and guide us as we go forward from that place of forgiveness, from the foot of the cross, that you would lead us in the way that leads to everlasting life. Amen. Please take a seat. We're going to have our reading now, and um, my wife Helen is going to read for us. The reading is taken from Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 to 38. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. This is the word of the Lord. Sorry, a bit of miscommunication there. Where am I going on until? Okay. Sorry, we're going on to verse 43. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Thank you, Helen. Do pray for Helen. Living with me is a nightmare sometimes. And let's pray for ourselves. Father, we thank you that your word speaks. And we pray that as we think about this story, you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're following it on one of the church Bibles, um, it's on page 137 in the New Testament. Do feel free, by the way, to pick one up from the shelf on your way in um, if there's not one in the pew with you. When you drop a stone in a pond, that event produces a ripple, doesn't it? A bit like the one that might appear on the screen behind me. And that, that ripple spreads. And then it disappears. Last term, uh, my son was learning about volcanoes in school, and we were looking at the eruption of Krakatoa, which is, um, I think, the biggest volcanic eruption that we know of. And in that, not a stone was dropped into the ocean, but basically a whole island exploded. And scientists have calculated the force of the explosion was so great that the seabed was exposed for 15 minutes. As the water um, of the sea down there in, in um, Southeast Asia, the water spread out in this giant tsunami. The, the seabed was dry for 15 minutes before the water came back. And those waves traveled all the way around the globe. And um, the ash cloud produced affected the climate on the earth for at least five years afterwards. Just a colossal, the power 
absolutely extraordinary. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an event of a a greater magnitude again. The waves that travelled around the world are still reverberating today, 2,000 years later. And rather than dying away, these ripples are getting bigger and bigger. The church is bigger now and growing faster now than at any point since Jesus died. It's an astonishing event. And what we're doing in these weeks following Easter is looking at how the resurrection of Jesus spread. Jesus said to his disciples, you will do what I do and even greater things. And so he kind of prepared them for the fact that after he had gone, astonishing things would continue to happen. And in the story that Helen's just read for us in Acts chapter 9, Um, Peter, who of course was one of the disciples, has reached a place called Joppa, which is called Jaffa nowadays. In Hebrew, P and F are the same letter, so it's the same name, same place, um, on the coast. And he arrived there, and this extraordinary thing happened. This lady called Tabitha or Dorcas, same name in different languages, um, had died, and he went into the house, and he took her hand and she got up. And she was alive. No wonder this became known throughout Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And I think one of the things that's happening in the book of Acts is these ripples are spreading out and people are asking themselves, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean? And that's a question we're still asking today. What does this resurrection mean? Well, on Easter Sunday, if you were here, we looked at Jesus' resurrection itself about the empty tomb. And the questions that pose, where is he? What's happened? And how that um, empty tomb was agreed to be a fact and still is by atheists and Christians alike and um, historians. They all agree the tomb was empty. What had happened to Jesus? Well, the conclusion, of course, the disciples came to and that Christians um, come to and people like myself who came to faith in my 20s, having explored the evidence for it, is that Jesus really did come back to life, even though that doesn't normally happen. So the first thing the resurrection means, of course, is that Jesus is alive. And that means he's alive today. I know that's an obvious thing, but it's important to say, you know, we're not here because of some kind of dead person that we're trying to remember. We believe Jesus is alive. The second thing that the resurrection meant and that these early disciples like Peter were working out and that stories like events like this helped them understand is that the life of Jesus, the resurrection life of Jesus, flows out to other people. So in, in his um, life, you know, before he died, Jesus raised Lazarus. Do you remember that story from the dead? Jesus himself was raised to life. And then his followers went on raising other people to life, like Dorcas in this story, like Eutychus, a young man who St. Paul in Acts chapter 20 raises to life from the dead. His life flows out, and it flows out in healing as well. Immediately before this, in uh, in Acts chapter 9, Peter visits visits the home of someone called Aeneas, who had been in bed for eight years because he was so ill. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you get up. And he did. And things like this, like Dorcas being raised from the dead, like Aeneas being healed, have happened, have continued to happen for all of the 20 centuries since Jesus died. When I was at theological college a few years ago in Oxford, one of the things I did was to look through the evidence that there is from um, secular and kind of um, religious historians for miracles through the 20 centuries from then to now. That's the kind of thing you have time to do when people pay for you to go off to theological college. And it was fascinating to to me that in every century, there were attested reports of these things happening. Now, of course, you may or may not believe they happened, but they're reported to have happened all the time. One that I found particularly interesting was reported by David Hume. If any of you have done philosophy, you might have heard of him. He lived in the 18th century, one of the great um, intellectuals, a great um, philosopher, and a noted sceptic of religion. There's a debate over whether he would have called himself an atheist or not, but he he, um, certainly didn't believe there was a God. And yet at the end of one of his essays about miracles and whether they can happen or not, he concludes they don't happen, they can't happen. Um, This is what he recorded in like an appendix to his essay. 
it's about something extraordinary that had happened in Paris during his lifetime, and he'd spoken to people who'd been there. He wrote, there, sure, there surely never was a greater number of miracles ascribed to one person than those which were lately said to have been wrought in France upon the tomb of Abbe Paris, the famous Jansenist. The curing of the sick, giving hearing to the deaf, and sight to the blind were everywhere talked of as the usual effects of that holy tomb. But what is more extraordinary, many of the miracles were immediately proved upon the spot before judges of unquestioned integrity, attested by witnesses of credit and distinction in a learned age and on the most eminent theatre that is now in the world. You find that interesting? Here he is, a, a man, an intellectual, an atheist, and yet he feels bound to record that um, these miracles were happening in Paris, and that, that, I mean, actually the royal court gathered around, and people would attest immediately to the truth of them. And he kind of enigmatically just puts this there at the end of this essay, saying miracles can't happen, and people will debate why, why he did that. But the truth is, stories like this are not as unusual as perhaps we might think. Um, two contemporary examples. A man called Ian McCormick, who's a New Zealander, um, was stung in the 1980s. He was diving off the coast of Mauritius and he was stung five times by a box jellyfish. And um, he was taken to hospital, but he died. And he had this extraordinary experience of heaven. And he came back to life about 15, laters on a sla 15 minutes later on a slab in the mortuary while a doctor was um, doing something with his foot and he suddenly opened his eyes, you can imagine. They all ran out of the room. They thought he was a ghost. And he's still alive today. He leads a church in London. If you Google a glimpse of eternity, you'll see his story. They've made a film of it. It is utterly extraordinary. I watched some of the video again last night. I thought about not preaching and just showing you the video because it is absolutely extraordinary. Go and Google it, a glimpse of eternity. Do you believe it? Well, that's your your choice. But these things happen. More recently still, a boy who rejoices in the name of Colton Burpo, um, who's American, had a similar experience as a child, and his father has written it up in a book called Heaven is Real. And they've made a, just made a film of that as well. An extraordinary story, something that you might think, well, I might read that in the Bible, but does it still happen? It is still happening. And so one of the things that the, the disciples came to see and that the Acts is trying to explain is the resurrection means this life, this extraordinary death-defying life that Jesus somehow has flows out to other people too. It's not, it was a once-only event, the resurrection of Jesus, but the implications of it are for everyone. Another thing that the disciples realized is it doesn't mean this happens to everyone. The reason these stories are recorded is that normally the disciples walk past, it's not like they walk past a graveyard and everyone pops out of the graves and starts following them. You know, normally this doesn't happen. Normally dead people die and they don't come back to life. And that's a good thing. I mean, do we all, would we all want to live to be the age of 200? Can you imagine a society where no one ever died? You know, it would just be, you know, a town like this would, would have kind of 20,000 people living in nursing homes and about 100 other people all trying to look after them, wouldn't it? So, you know, death is a reality. And I don't need to tell us that in this church family because we've seen Ali Summers, Belinda Rawlings, Rob Cade, little baby Jacob Webb. They've all died from this church family in the last few years. We live with death. And it's a mystery to us, isn't it, why God allows that? But he seems to. The New Testament describes these healings, these resurrections, with the word signs. They are signs. And if, if you wanted to go to Clifton this afternoon on this beautiful day, uh, you could drive out of Marlow and there would be some lovely brown signs pointing you towards Clifton. Now, if you were to stop at the first one and gaze at the sign and spend the afternoon looking at it, I guarantee you, you wouldn't have as good a time as if you went where the sign is pointing you and ended up at Clifton for the afternoon. Okay, signs are not meant to be things that you stop and gaze at as if they were all there is. Signs point us to something else, and the signs of healings and of resurrections point us towards Jesus and the life that he offers. So the resurrection does not mean that disciples of Jesus are removed from this realm of suffering and death, but it does mean 
that whether we live into old age or whether we die young, whether we never have an illness or whether we suffer all our lives with illness, Jesus has defeated sickness and death and can bring us into a life where there'll be no more pain or suffering or tears or death. That's what the resurrection means. Jesus wants to take us with him through death into eternal life. And these things are signs of that. This life that Jesus offers comes to us through other disciples. God could do all this himself, but he chooses to use Peter to go to Tabitha's house, to visit her, to speak with the mourning widows, and then it's Peter who gets to present Tabitha to them. And he stays with them for some time. You, you can imagine it, can't you? Explaining what's happened. If you follow Jesus, you are far, far more powerful than you realise. Because you carry in you this extraordinary life bursting out of you like all the bulbs bursting out of the earth outside in springtime. His life flows through you. And Jesus taught his disciples what to do with that. He gathered his disciples together. This is in Matthew chapter 10. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is very near to you. So go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. How's that for a sermon? We're gathered here this morning. God is much closer to us than we realise, so let's go. That's what Jesus said. You're far more powerful than you realise. Now, if you're anything like me, you hear something like that and you go, well, not me. I can't do that. There's no way I could do that. And that's the point. We can't do it. The source of it is Jesus. The source of this life is Jesus Christ. The words I read earlier, Peter said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And all the way through Acts, you see that. You know, we looked at it last week, if you were here, the annual meeting. Um, Why do you stare at us, they said, as if by our own power we can make someone who's um, ill be healed. No, it's in the name of Jesus that people's lives are changed. The source of this power is Jesus. John taught his disciples, um, Jesus taught his disciples, this is John chapter 5, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing on his own. And I think this is where we, one of the places we see Jesus identifying with us in our humanity. The Son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Indeed, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whomsoever he wishes. So the picture here, I'd written this before Tony mentioned it earlier, but it's like a border collie, like a sheepdog, looking up at the shepherd, waiting to see what the shepherd wants them to do, and then going and doing it. The will originates in God, but the disciple follows and does things because the Father wants them to happen. And I believe Jesus taught his disciples this as a way of helping them to see how to live in this extraordinary life of resurrection. So how do we notice what it is that the Father is doing, that he's wanting us to do? Well, practice is one way. You know, if I was to go and grab a dog from the, from the park and um, drive it off to a sheepdog trial and say, right, here we go, what would happen? Disaster. I'd probably get arrested by the dog owners and by the people organising the sheepdog trial. But if someone turns up with a dog who's practised and learnt to hear the shepherd's voice, amazing. So we have to practise. And it's not as hard as you might think once we start to pay attention. Sometimes it's very obvious that God is doing something that we have no control over. I think of one time when uh, we lived in London. I had two, um, my two best friends, um, these two guys, I, I knew their number by heart, by, off by heart. I didn't have them stored in my phone. And so one night I went to phone one of them, but I got the numbers wrong and I put the first four numbers of one number of one friend and the second four numbers from the other friend's number. You get what? You, you've already seen my attention to details, not that good. And so I phoned the number and I knew immediately something was wrong because a woman answered the phone and these are both guys who lived on their own. And uh, so straight away I said, I'm really sorry, I think I've got the wrong number. And um, she said, oh, well, that's okay. 
and there was something, just something in her voice that wavered and um, that I just noticed. I don't know why. And I said to her, um, I hope you don't mind me asking, but are you okay? And um, we had a conversation. I can't really remember what we said. And then I put the phone down and thought nothing more of it. And the next morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang and I answered it. And it was this lady. And she said, I don't know if you remember, you phoned the wrong number last night. And I went, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I thought she phoned up to say, you know, <laughs> that I disturbed her or something. And, uh, and she said, I wanted you to know something. She said, when the phone rang last night, I had run a bath, I'd put candles around the bath, I'd put a pile of pills on the table in the bathroom, and I was about to take an overdose and kill myself. And there was something in your voice when you asked if I was okay that made me think, maybe there is someone out there who cares. So I didn't kill myself, and I'm alive this morning, and I wanted to phone you and tell you, can you help? Now, my entire contribution to that story was dialing a wrong number, yeah? Your hands up if you can dial a wrong number. God, on the other hand, had something extraordinary planned for that lady's life. And so I said to her, I can't do anything for you, but I know someone who can. Jesus loves you, and he's alive, and he wants to give you a new life that's different from your old one. And I asked her where she lived, and it turned out she lived a couple of doors away from a friend of mine from church, and they started, and a couple of weeks later I got to meet her, and she joined the church, and her life was completely transformed, all because of what the Father was doing. Now, that's quite a dramatic story, but um, other times things just, that are just very normal happen. You know, in the last place that we lived in, in Surrey, in Rygate, uh, one day I got asked to go and have coffee with uh, a family who... who um, a friend of mine knew. So Liz, this friend and I, we went round and we sat in the lounge and we talked to them for about an hour. And it was just very nice and I wasn't quite sure why we were there. Um, and then after an hour, the husband, Alex, said to me, um, do you know, I read the Bible on the toilet every day. And I said, no, I didn't know that, Alex, actually. Um, but thanks for telling me. Why do you do that? And it turned out they were just desperate. They never went to church. Apart from their wedding day, they'd never been to church. But they were desperate for something more. And he, for years, I can't remember, I don't know if you can remember, three, three four years, he'd been reading the Bible every day on the toilet. And, um, and he wanted to know. He said, I think there's life here somewhere. And I know, you go, you know you're from the church, so I wanted to ask you where it is. So we invited them along, and like a few months later, I baptised all five members of that family at the same time. Husband, wife, two teenage boys, and a little baby girl. Um, and they, they were French, and they, this is no, nothing to do with the sermon, but anyway, they handed me their little daughter naked to baptise, like in a pool, like we had on Sunday by full immersion. It's one of the most vivid memories of me getting ordained. I kind of wish I'd just thought that and not said it out loud, but anyway. <laughs> this poor little girl's horror, and then I dunked her out under the water. She wouldn't go near me for about nine months after that. Anyway, they all came to faith and they still now that they're, they're so, they're like came to life and they loved it and they told all their friends, you know, what did I do? Well, I said, do you know, yeah, I'd like to meet a family I've never met before and I went along and I listened and then said, um, well, I think what you're looking for is Jesus. Now, I mean, that's not that hard, is it? But that's what God does. That's what we are. We are the people through whom the resurrection spreads and brings life. I wonder who you're going to meet this week. I wonder who you might have a conversation with even before you walk out through those doors. I wonder where God's attention is in your life this coming week. Because you know, it might not be the list of 4,000 things you've got to get do, done by 5pm on Friday. It might not be the thing that, the thought you just can't get out of your mind. It might be something completely different. And it might just be that if there's just something in you that thinks, you know, I am going to make time for that person. Or I am going to ask how they are. Or I am going to pray for them. Or I am going to take up my courage in both hands and go to that thing or speak to that person. Just maybe you might bring more life than you ever imagined. In a moment, we're going to take communion together. And when we take communion, we identify ourselves with Jesus' death. Because we're eating the meal that he ate with his disciples, the last meal he ever ate on earth before his death. 
And we're, identi- we're saying, you know, we are dead. There is something in us that without God just can't come to life. But what we're also doing is anticipating the wedding banquet in heaven when we see everything clearly, when there's no more death, there's no more pain or illness or tears or bereavement, when we all gather together and live in fullness the life that Jesus has promised. And for now, we're in between. But as we take this communion, I invite you to receive, as you receive the bread and wine or a prayer, to receive this life and to take it with you and to let it ripple, to go and try and sense what it is God has for you this week because that is the adventure of life as it's meant to be. It's what Jesus promised when he said, I've come to give you life in all its fullness. And it's not just for us. You might have been here last week where I've I've calculated if everyone in Marlow came to church, we would have to run 45 morning services in this building, even if it was packed. There are so many people out there who might be about to commit suicide, whose marriage is falling apart, who thinks there's no one who loves them, no one who cares, who thinks they're not important enough to matter to anyone. What I'm saying is, go! Go! And see if you can pick up something of what God's doing and be part of it and spread life wherever you go. Amen?